And I remember that morning in my office saying, Lord, what about the students? And, and, and he answering me, well, what if I plan the church I want to plan with the people I want to bring you? And that, I think that was a, a key moment in which I accepted God's plan for my church. <laughs> Welcome to Church Planting 101. We are your hosts, Drew and Megan Land. This is episode two, where we asked 10 church planters from six different continents what they wished they had done differently when they planted. And one of the things that will definitely impress you in this session is how each of the church planters did not give up. Despite their mistakes and despite the things that they wish that they could have done over. Mm-hmm. And in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, it reminds us that we are earthen vessels. That means we have limitations. And the first thing you'll realize when you plant a church is that you have limitations. Don't be shocked. God is not shocked. You'll be tempted to think, who is sufficient to do this? But just remember Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 5. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. That certainly was our experience when we planted in Durban, South Africa in 2006. And we led this beautiful church for seven years. And the whole time we were aware that it was God's grace, not our competency that held it all together. Definitely. In this episode, we introduce you to Cristobal Ceron. He is from Santiago, Chile, and he's part of the Anglican churches in South America. What becomes evident as you listen to Cristobal is his passionate love for the Word of God and his commitment to keep the gospel at the center of all he does. Enjoy this episode. I'm Cristobal. I'm Cristobal Cedron. I'm married to Alejandra. We have three daughters, uh, 14, 11, and 9 years old. And um, we've been married for over 16 years. Um, we met each other in an Anglican church in Chile. Uh, an Anglican church in Chile. Uh, in Chile, we are evangelical Anglicans, and in this particular context, it was um, especially uh, charismatic and enth- enthusiastic church, and w- that longed to see people converted. And I think from that very beginning, we've been always. Um, involved with mission and evangelism and training others and dreaming that the Lord may do something special in our in our country. I've been pastoring a church for 10 years already, uh, a church that uh, uh, my wife and I, and I planted 10 years ago. And um, I'm also doing this job as a part-time job because the other half time half half part of my time is i'm a rector of our bible college in chile so i'm the pastor of my church part-time and the other half time is um i'm the rector of uh, of the place in which we train other pastors for the anglican church in chile and also in south america hoping to bring other people from south america Um, I, I think especially as a, a, a young or early church planter, how, whatever your age is, as you're getting into it, mm-hmm. to recognize that those mistakes, those failures are not always going to be the end of you. So, um, you know, get that out of your head right away. You don't, you don't need to think of or relate to failure uh, or mistakes as uh, your uh, demise. Right. I would have gone slower. I would have started smaller and built slower, but built slower through discipleship. So having spending more time with the team that God gave me, um, imparting to them the importance and the skills to be able to reach people, to evangelize, share the gospel, bring people in, and we disciple them as we go and grow in that way in an organic fashion. It's not sexy. It doesn't make the headlines, but it's sturdy. It's strong. And in the long run will actually produce, I think a much stronger and healthier church. 
I think the danger when you when you go to do something new, um, there's excitement, uh, but I think you you can rush things. And I, I think in the in the early days we were in too much of a hurry. And again, God sorted that out for us. But when you're in a hurry, um, yeah, I think I think there's some detail that you begin to not necessarily miss, but you can even ignore it. And when we're planting something, um, yeah, the little by little is important. And I think you can get frustrated with how little, little by little is and, um, and want to rush. And I'm, particularly when you're sitting with vision, because when you're sitting with vision, to some degree, you, you have an end in mind. And, but, you know, uh, I think in hindsight, yeah, we, we pushed some people away that I think we were, we were called to journey with. And if we just hadn't been in so much of a hurry, we, we would have caught that better. Um, but I think us taking the time to actually cultivate and build team, take our time, like that's okay. I know for us, we were young, we were eager, and uh, we wanted to get things off the ground fast. Um, we had been given some advice that you just run at a sprint for the first year, try to get things off the ground, and then you can ease back a little bit. Mm -hmm. For us, we ran at a sprint for the first like six or seven years. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> barely got things off the ground. So I, I'm yeah. not sure that that advice is, is always gonna be the best. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for us to have taken more time to, to build some deep roots and uh, build our uh, stronger financial position, um, get through some, of, maybe even get through some of the early years. Like we planted a church with no team, no very little money while we were having, while we were just beginning a family and I was working full time in a sort of corporate business type position at the local university. Um, so bivocational working a 50 to 55 hour a week job, it was just too much. It, it was, was way too much. We would invest more early on in our marriage and in our family. And um, ministry takes its toll and life takes its toll on both of those fronts. And so um, going back and looking back, that's certainly something that uh, we would just protect more jealously and invest in um, more generously. That, we didn't actually take very good care of ourselves. Right. The first several years, I think we were emotionally tapped out. We were physically tapped out. We, we both gained weight. We weren't eating well. We weren't sleeping well. We weren't doing family life particularly well. We weren't planting very, I mean, like everything, <laughs> everything that we were suffered. doing yeah. kind of suffered mm -hmm. and uh, and we just simply weren't taking good care of ourselves. And I think that's a, a real essential factor in church planting, really just any part of life, but church planting in particular. In terms of self-care, things like getting enough sleep, eating as you know healthy enough, um, getting exercise, having friendships. And, you know, for us, our experiences, um, it's difficult to be friends with the people that you're pastoring to a certain level. Like there's definite good quality friendship, but having those people who you can be really raw and authentic and vulnerable with who you're not pastoring, um, I think we would have done that um, differently in the beginning as well. I think we really needed that and we didn't have that for the first several years. Number one is Vanessa and I doing a lot better, and me doing a lot better as a husband of, of bringing her along with with the vision and and the communication. Uh, I think you know you're you're out there, you're planting. There's no other team. It's only it's only your wife and yourself and, and your children if you have children at the time. And and I think um, you know I I ran with a lot of things without. Um, you know, kind of patiently bringing my wife along or envisioning her. And so, you know, it created a lot of disagreements and we didn't know how to disagree at, at a lead couple level. You know, it, it, you know, it almost feels like... It wasn't peaceful at all. Yeah, it, it almost feels <laughs> like, you know, um, we, and I don't think we disagreed in, in the heart or the vision. I think we disagreed in the methods. And, but, you know, being, never being in that place before, you know, you just feel like, your world's ending because you know you disagree about you know where the church is going and it's only the two of you and so I I, I think um, being on the same page is in, in really visioneering that thing with your spouse uh, um, you know to, as as much as possible you know because I mean 
those of us who have planted know that it, it all changes. Yes. It all changes. <laughs> and the things that we, we hold on to early on are just not even an issue later on. But um, I think I uh, have a more deeper conversations with my wife regarding her expectations and implications of a church planting project like this one. Um, at the beginning, we, I think I, I, I did a lot of assumption regarding where she was at this project in, and, and she was very open to, to, ex, to go for the adventure. But I'm not sure if we really dealt with all of the intricacies of, of the, and the details that were, we were going to face in the process after two, three, four years. I think Jody was such a dreamer and a visionary. Um, and I am the kind of woman that thinks, I count the cost, number one, and number two, it's like, what is the plan? We're gonna, we're gonna go forward mm -hmm. <laughs> and reach to this, you know, reach this next place. What's the plan? And you know, we have children and we have, you know, we gotta count everything in. Um, and, um, and Jody would just, he would just dream and he would dream just freely. And in my head, I'm racking up how much it's gonna take and what, you know, just the energy it's gonna, it's gonna take from us. And um, and the Lord finally said to me, and, and we weren't communicating verbally. It was more like just kind of yelling and, you know, just <laughs> questioning everything. It's, uh, it's, getting, it's getting real, friend. <laughs> yeah, you know, it gets tough, right? You, you hit these moments. And um, the Lord said to me, Vanessa, let him dream. And I'll let you know when it's time to plan. And I, I just had to dwell, not dwell, but I had to depend on the Holy Spirit's voice. Mm -hmm. And I had to just allow things to roll off my back and not take everything so seriously. Um, so my daughter w was only 18 months old when we first arrived in Leeds. And when we used to put her to bed at night, we had a, like a, a photo montage of like all her friends uh, from our sending church. And she she couldn't communicate because she was so young but she's just point to the picture and start crying and um in the end we had to take the picture down because it, it sort of broke our hearts but it it also emphasized how we felt we felt very lonely and our probably biggest mistake or what i would do differently was that we didn't take a team and it was not that we uh, didn't ask a few people to come with us but our sending church had sent a number of church plants before then and um, the people we asked either weren't ready to come or didn't want to come and so I, I think it's just so much harder when there's no team uh, you obviously it's quite lonely but you have to go so much slower and it feels so so much harder establishing vision and the culture of the church plant because no one carried that apart from us and so whenever someone joined the church, we had to do the hard work of bringing them through into sort of the vision and the culture of the church that we felt God had given us. A lot. As we were debriefing these questions, it's like, oh boy. What? All, all the big ones in the beginning, we did not do very well. Um, we didn't have much of a team. We had, team. we had one couple who was actually commuting to a different vineyard church about an hour away in Richmond, Virginia. So they were on board right away, but that was pretty much it. And then I was seven months pregnant with our first child. So we pretty much like, you know, almost doubled the size of our group by, by birthing a child. You know, there's just something very biblical about leadership in team. So when I think of the Apostle Paul, um, when he went to places where he was on his own, so when he goes to Athens in Acts 17, he has to leave Silas and Timothy in Berea and he goes to Athens and he preaches this great message uh, that Luke records for you, but there seems to be little gospel fruit that we don't know if he left a church in Athens. We don't think so. And you compare that to some of the other places like when he goes to Corinth he's got Priscilla and Aquila and Apollos and he's got this team with him and just seems much more fruitful and so I definitely feel like we messed that up. То есть и церковь вовлечена и люди не оставлены и это как апостольское видение в миссии церкви. So what will we change is um, the church is um, involved 
and people is the, uh, is like looking after uh, looked after from a apostolic team uh, you know what one of one of our approaches was we wanted to bring the whole church along and i think what happened was we we in doing that we kind of privy everyone in the life of the church to probably things they they weren't able to carry you know um and so we were making decisions together because it was a young church and you know it was, it was a lot more democratic rather than you know kind of biblical leadership and having biblical government established and and we we knew we were wanting to establish biblical government elders and deacons and and so it wasn't that we weren't trying to do that but we were just trying to mature everyone at the same time in the same place and uh, when it came time to you know set in elders and deacons i mean there was a, an a large amount of people who were disgruntled and hurt because they had been there, been doing the same thing. The and, and we had, you know, kind of brought them all along in the same way. And, and so I think we would have, we would have, we would have done that differently. And, and I still don't know how, I think a lot of it had to do with, you know, maybe even their insecurities and personalities. But uh, I do know that there would have been something a little a little different in that approach. You know, I think most of those people grew in that time. Most of those people are still with us today. But I, I, it was very difficult because um, there was, it was almost like we had to um, start again, you know, because we had to reestablish, hey, you know, listen, you know, we've brought you all along as leaders, but you're not all going to be governmental leaders. So the context of our church was, that the people we planted with, uh, like myself, had come from uh, a bigger church or bigger churches and had had negative experiences of overly dominant, uh, domineering, controlling leadership. And so as we came together, there was a bit of a reaction to uh, against that. And we didn't want to see any of any of the sort. But because of that, I, as the leader, overcorrected and created a sense of um yeah we 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 are all in this together you know we'll make decisions yes i'll have the final say sure but you know um and it, and it created an unhealthy uh dare i say democratic um style of team leadership which made it difficult for me to actually lead in the way that i was mentally and so i did it with the right heart for the right reasons um, and so if I was to do it differently, I think we would have had taken more time to unpack everybody's hurts, pains, fears around that domineering style of leadership and then take time to reconstruct a biblical model of leadership. And in particular, establishing a kind of first among equals. What does that mean? How do we lead like Jesus led without dominating people, but at the same time without completely drowning the gift and the calling of leadership? Perhaps, perhaps one mistake we made is probably... Um, setting in, uh, not elders, um, we, we certainly took our time to set in elders, but maybe setting in lower level leaders, if I can use that phrase, that's a horrible phrase, when I, even as I say that, but I think you know what I mean, kind of, um, you know, small group leaders or, or connect group leaders, setting in those a little too quickly, probably, you know, um, leaning into men and women who ne didn't necessarily have our hearts. Another thing that I could be, uh, do differently was um, that I began with a, a very homogeneous approach to church. I'm not sure if you, you've heard about that, but I was wanting to, to, to plant a student church. People that were adults, very different backgrounds, contexts, countries were coming to this church. And, I'm, and, and I was praying, Lord, and, uh, what, what about the students? And I remember that morning in my office saying, Lord, what about the students? And, and, and he answering me, well, what if I plan the church I want to plan with the people I want to bring you? And that, I think that was a, a key moment in which I accepted God's plan for my church <laughs> instead of uh, me pursuing the plan that I was trying to impose him. Um, and since then, I think I had an openness to, to the real, what the real Church of God is. And very different people, diverse in their backgrounds, uh, level of studies, education, 
ages, uh, uh, social, economical, political backgrounds. Well, the Church of God is is so diverse, and we we should think about that when we plan um, churches. I think for us. W- so it's really important that we specialised, but I think we specialised for too long. And so it's always felt as a church that we're playing catch up with diversity, diversity of ethnicity, diversity of age, diversity of class. And so, you know, this, this reality is I feel like we're still learning how to do that and build a diverse church. Uh, we had just even last year, we had a couple who were in their 60s from Poland uh, join our church and initially I felt like we did a great job welcoming them Um, but sadly they left after a year and they sort of said we just just didn't ever feel in or feel a part of things and that really grieves me and you know Revelation 7 tells us that all history is building to this moment where all nations will stand together before Jesus but right now I think we feel like we're failing to even sit together in church Uh, if I could have my time again I would love to push the diversity agenda far more intentionally and and far more quickly If, if I were to do it again I think one thing that we would do is probably just make that move, but live here for a while, mm-hmm. like get to know the area. Um, just try to be a part of the community to get involved in our neighborhood and our city. Our city. Um, landing here in East Africa, um, we knew that we'd be an English speaking church, um, but the everyday language on the street spoken by most people is Swahili. Mm-hmm. And um, we didn't invest in uh, learning Swahili early on. And um, that was for a couple of reasons, but um, I think that is something if we could go back, that's something we would look at is um, because it's just another way to connect more deeply with the culture and connect with more people. Mm -hmm. And I think another practical thing we'd um, do differently is think um, carefully about where we'd live, um, because I feel we've also spent a lot of energy um, thinking about that and actually moving homes um, initially. So the first place we were in. We lived there for about nine months and then we moved again um, to um, a place um, closer to the venue, but then far away from Bonisi's workplace and far away from the school. And so moved again, closer to Bonisi's workplace, closer to the school. And so, yeah, I think um, if we could go back, it'll be okay, let's just slow down, think about this. Where is everyone going to need to be? And then pick a place. smaller payroll none if possible um so we we went with the sort of big bang approach we are in a city with uh, a lot of people uh, and uh money talks big flashy houses big flashy cars and and if you're not careful you can get caught up in uh in in that kind of thinking there's lots of big successful churches and you can get caught up in the thinking that says if you're going to attract people you have to in some ways look like a miniature version of these big impressive churches and so we overstretched overcommitted and uh if you're trying to go start with a big bang you need people in place who've got the skills capacity uh, to be able to do some of the things that you need done you also need to be able to compensate them for their time because you need their time in order to accomplish that. Um, and the result of that was that uh, right from the beginning, we were under serious financial strain because the people I had called into these positions now were depending on that salary. And uh, so that was a noose around my neck right from the beginning. So the, the uh, thing I would do differently is uh, try not to have anyone on payroll, or we'll try and have as few people as possible and work with volunteers. And the skills that you don't have, you don't have. Do what you can with those that you do and the people whose time is available, and God will bless that. We even gave a very short time for a very short time. That is, to open the team, to open the source of God's love for themselves, 
для того, чтобы там жить и mm -hmm. совершать миссию. Yeah, what we also changed, uh, would change it, if we could do it earlier, is just the support we've been doing for people before. So we've been supporting people before um, financially, and uh, this was for the long term. But now we are doing it differently, and we are supporting them for uh, maybe for a year. And then they need to start work there, to live there. So not being just a missionary that is supported. Да, эффективнее люди работают или свой бизнес начинают. Легко контактируют с неверующими людьми. Также применяются. Спасибо. important to to acknowledge or to to be prepared to to try things to be prepared to to um i, I mean I, I, obviously given the 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 kind of biblical parameters we we stay very true to those we stay very true to 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 the truths found in scripture but but i think a lot of church planting is as you get to know the place as you get to know the context is is trying things and tweaking things and adjusting things and not being afraid to not being afraid to make adjustments not being afraid to make changes not being afraid to try this if it works continue it where there is life um a friend of mine always used to say you know church planting is as simple as going after the life of god and i don't think it's that simple but i do see the the the, the truth in that and and you know god's life is on things we we go after that I didn't mention in my plan to plant a church in the written in the written thing in the PowerPoint presentation that I was promoting everyone. Uh, I didn't put a word about mercy ministry. To my shame, um, I was thinking about students ministry, university, you see that kind of thing, and and. Um, the Lord again was merciful to us and, and after three or four years he put that theme into our strategy by raising um, leaders and, and but more than not not leaders but Christians that had a real heart for the mercy ministry God loves you and God, God, God is loving you now by by the, by, by 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 Jesus Christ. What what He has done in your life, even before you have planted a church, He's loving you already. Um, and please uh, rejoice in that now. Think about that. He sent His only beloved Son to die for you and to 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 ransom you and to bring you into his family and that is a solid reality and please enjoy that now that is an unshakable reality for you and uh, with that conviction as a child of god think about um, what god is planning to do with your life to love other people likewise and, and so um, without thinking, forget about church planting being a sexy enterprise that has to be run by catchy and skillful heroes. And as you want to pastor the people that God will give you in the place He has placed in your heart or in the heart of the mother church. Um, don't worry much about what you will do, but how will you love? And if you are willing to love people, in spite of the difficulties on the way, so don't forget about the, the, what you're gonna do in terms of planning, but think about a, of loving, uh, loving people. Trust that the gospel is the power of God, not only of salvation, but also for the edification of His church. So don't make shortcuts and keep trusting keep trusting the gospel of jesus is the only legitimate and endurable fuel that will in god's timing ignite the people of god for renewal and revival please if everything in the context is leading you to change your, your strategy 
be willing to change everything, but don't change the gospel of God. That gospel is the one that is going to build the church for his glory and for the good of those who don't know still the beautiful name of Jesus. So God bless you guys. And uh, I pray that God guide, guides you uh, and the power of the Holy Spirit guides you and anoints you for the, for the next step in your lives to love his glory and love the people of God that he will place before you. We definitely tried to do too much too soon to go too big too soon. We launched a university program. We launched a youth group, a ministry with the poor, all at the same time of planting a church. And we had nine people on staff and we were renting offices that were way too expensive. If I had to do it over again, I would definitely go slower with an intentional focus on making disciples who make disciples. Yes, and I love what Jim and Megan Blakely said at the beginning of this video. How a church planter, you've got to put away the idea that our failures are the end of us. God can use the greatest failures for His glory. Now, let's consider what was said. So get into your groups of three or four. And of all the things that the church planters wished they had done differently, which one do you think would be most damaging to your church plant if you don't heed their warning. So explain your answers in your groups, and then obviously feel free to discuss anything else that maybe stood out to you in this session. And in our next episode, we'll look at the essential characteristics you'll need as a church planter. We'll see you there.